but it's going to take time to move. And what you know, Korea's in there, Taiwan's in there, Vietnam's in there. That's where all the supply chains are going to move. You're going to see the high tech is going to transfer to China, into Singapore, and into India, probably into Israel, into Mexico. And then you're going to see the other supply chain move into those other countries. And that's going to be probably a one to two years of, of I think, grief around the world. But it has to happen. And, but you, think, Bob, not, you think they can reestablish that quickly in one to two years? Or do you think it'll take a longer amount of time to get up and running? Absolutely not. They can do it. If, you, if you're losing your customers, you can throw a factory up there in a heartbeat. Unemployment has surged in the United States in response to the lockdowns. Never before in U.S. history have we seen unemployment rise this quickly. And as the economy slowly reopens, the future is still uncertain. And this is where Trade Genius Academy comes in. They'll teach anybody willing to learn how to go from complete beginner in cryptocurrency, binary options, or stock market to find a path and ways to make money just like trading pros. And if you've never traded before and want to learn, you can take advantage of the market when it goes up and down, exactly like these times we're experiencing. Sign up for one of many Trade Genius online educational courses. Discover the lucrative world of trading. Receive personal coaching from Bob Kudla and Philip Cleaver of Trade Genius. And right now, during the month of July, you can use the promo code FREEDOM for a whopping 40% off all non-bundled items. TradeGeniusAcademy.com. The link's in the description box below. And on with the interview. Good afternoon, everyone. As always, one of my favorites to talk to about economy, crypto, metals, commodities, and everything in between the state of our world and how he and I both think things might be moving. Although we disagree sometimes, we do agree sometimes, too. And this is, I think today you're going to get a lot of value out of what we talk about. And now that the virus is not having the effect that it's supposed to have in scaring people, well, now they're going to scare them with the stock market crash, you know. So, you know, the, the, the powers that be are always going to have something in front of people to, to freak them out. And they come into 2021. I can't even imagine the diseases that are going to be, that are going to be bubbling up out of China with these floods and with the, uh, the um, you know, now they got a swine flu going. And, you know, so it, they're just going to keep the tension on people. And, and look, you just want to be in stuff. You want to be in safety trades right now. So gold miners, silver miners, copper miners, uranium. Look, the United States is, is going to, if there's going to be a renaissance in the nuclear industry. They have these, these new technology now that's getting certified, basically called molten salt nuclear plants. I don't know if you've heard of those, but they can't melt down because the, 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 the maximum heat that can be generated in a fission type event is lower then basically the, the salt content that's surrounding and infusing the, the uranium salts. So it just can't, it can't blow up. You can't have a container leak because you're not under pressure. And, and so uranium is going to be huge. And, and you're going to see our government's going to put a kibosh on, on imports on that. They're going to protect the exports on that. And then there's other strategic metals too. There's you know, a company called SBSW. People need to throw a little bit in there, tuck it away. NAK, buy a little bit. That's a gold miner. The largest reserve in the world is in Alaska. Give it to your grandkids. I mean, there's some tremendous places out there. Copper mines are shutting down all over the world. That's why copper prices have been, have been flying higher. You know, so there's a copper shortage going on. So there's a lot of opportunities in amongst all this, you know, doom and gloom, if you will, to make a lot of money. Yeah, so bring circle back to that supply chain shortage again. You know, we're starting to see that, and I, I see it in the stores here. For example, I went to Best Buy because I needed just a, a dual plug-in for one of my microphones. Half the store is gone. They're not getting it back. So I ended up talking with the manager for a little bit while they were trying to do some SKU search and see if they could find the piece I was looking for. And he said, yeah, well, as soon as it's already either pre-ordered or it's not coming and it's a lot of it doesn't even make, it's already pre-ordered, so they just call and say, hey, your thing's in. So the same with gold and silver. You know, China, would they have 83 fake tons of gold over there? And now if the supply chains are not into that whole mining, refining, delivery, because there's a breakdown in the supply chains with just general goods, 
Uh, we start to see it with food. I don't know how many, one 700 tons of potatoes is the one newest one from last week, like the wow. And then, you know, now we're starting to talk about metals not being delivered even in the refined form. So I think assets just going to get stranded somewhere and they're going to value those and then be able to move them through paper instead of taking physical delivery. Because I know when they were doing, you know, these miners are a great one because they're measuring how many ounces are in, you know, the, the tonnage of ore out there before refinement. And are they going to get a dollar valuation? They can get, there's, there's a lot of changes I see coming and you can just kind of see that around that corner, a sliver out there. Supply chain seems to be in a crux right now. And if we go do into a two point lockdown here, somewhere in September, October, you know, the supply chains are gonna just constrict and everybody's gonna get stuck out and you either have what you have or you won't have it. And I'm just curious how metals will still be delivered if they get stuck in the supply chain or will there be uh, direct contractors that that's all they do. Like we saw in the British military in the 1600s, the modern minimum, that's all they were tasked with, delivering food supply and wheat shipments they were they were just like contractors just for wheat shipments to get it to market everything else was not moving the wood and all these types of things for tools back then wasn't but the food was on a contract using the military so i'm really curious you know how you see the supply chains in many different ways and shapes and forms moving out if we come and as we are coming into 2.0 because they're trying to re-scare everybody now. So, oh, it's worse than it was before. It's scarier. They you infected 71 people in an elevator in 30 seconds by breathing with them. That was the newest ridiculous story I saw today. There will be no 2.0. So you don't think so? No, there's no, there's no way, no way it's going to happen. The, the, the Democratic mayors are broke. The Democratic governors are broke. You're already seeing this, this wave that they had that called the protest wave of COVID. It was already proven to be not deadly at all, and um, and you know and look at it, Arizona's already falling back under a thousand cases now, new cases a day. You know, in Texas, only in a Florida, like 150 new beds were taken. Over 30,000 people were tested positive, but only 150 went into the hospital. So it's, it's basically saying if we test the flu like we tested COVID, we see the same stuff. So that's off the board. Now, what's happening though, if it's if it's international supply chain, big problem. Okay. So, you know, you talked about your thing. I wanted to get a wireless mouse, 17 days at Best Buy. You know, because they they sure did. This Hong Kong peg goes, we're going into the Christmas season. You can kiss Christmas goodbye in terms of getting your Christmas gifts in. They're gonna have to re- Establish the change. It's going to be, it's going to be really interesting because I think we're going to go the Anglosphere. We're going to go Five Eyes. I don't know if you ever heard what the Five Eyes are, right? United States, Canada, England, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and then they're going to have the secondary tiers off of that. You know, you're talking India, you're talking Singapore, you're talking Mexico, you're talking Israel, you're talking probably Brazil, who's going to be left out of the bag. Is going to be China. It's going to be left out of the bag. Unstrategic Africa will be left out of the bag. Western Europe will be left out of the bag. Middle East, other than Israel, will be left out of the bag. And that's going to be the new trading block. But it's going to take time to move. And what, you know, Korea's in there, Taiwan's in there, Vietnam's in there. That's where all the supply chains are going to move. You're going to see the high tech is going to transfer to China, into Singapore, and into India probably in Israel and in Mexico. And then you're gonna see the other supply chain move into those other countries. And that's gonna be probably a one to two years of, of I think, grief around the world. But it has to happen. And but you think, Bob, I think they can reestablish that quickly in one to two years, or do you think it'll yeah. take a longer amount of time to get up and running? Absolutely not. They can do it. If, you, if you're losing your customers, you can throw a factory up there in a heartbeat. So uh, they sure they can do it. I mean, look at Tesla building a gigafactory in Berlin. Going to have it up in 90 days. You know, when you have to do something, you get stuff done. If you told Vietnam, guess what? Every one of your citizens from 18 to 65 is going to have a job, but you're going to need to build these factories in 120 days. We're taking them all from China and moving down your way. You'll have factories in 120 days. You know, you're going to watch India's going to do whatever it takes to steal those high-tech jobs from China and India. Look, India is just as educated as the Chinese. 
India has a natural relationship with the United States more so than I think, even though the Chinese are infused, is the Indian um, population has, has infused their high tech with, with the United States. So I think there's gonna be some natural fits there. And yeah, it'll be fast. It'll be fast. What I worry about is is the uh, you know basically the negative reaction from from China when people start pulling their factories out. Those are going to be all lost assets. Yeah, and you wonder what the pricing will be for those new products. So let's say they do start manufacturing in Mexico again, compared to what it was in China, or what will be the new pricing for something coming out of Vietnam versus what it was from China? Because all the trans shipping points coming through Hong Kong specifically, and a lot of the East Coast. Uh, port cities like Tianjin, Shanghai, all the way down, Ningbo, you know, they're going to lose that whole arm of, uh, you know, ocean shipping as, as well and that transport links. Well, so I'm wondering what the up. price might be in a new setup of economy with new manufacturing hubs, new transportation links, comparatively what we're paying right now, pennies on the dollar for getting things out of China, you know, because everything's manufactured in China. So, well, and th that computer mouse you just referenced there, well, let, let's use the uh, $15 is, uh, is the price that you're getting from China. Will it still be 15 coming out of Mexico or another manufacturer point because labor is going to be a little more expensive, you know, as we come up these country value chains here? What do you think the price yeah, might be yeah. for that same item then coming out of a different country like Mexico? Yeah, not, not much higher out of Mexico, but out of the United States, we'll probably see double digit inflation, but you'll see jobs here too. See, so, you know, every, nothing, there's no free lunch, right? So they, we got deflation on consumer goods, but then everybody lost their jobs. You know, so now the jobs will come back, there'll be higher wages and higher inflation. So, you know, the difference being is that the control now is within the United States versus the control being in a, in a country that absolutely wants to see us harm. So there's gonna be, there's gonna be that. But these other countries still gotta compete to get their product in the United States. And so you'll see that. And the robotic manufacturing, these days are absolutely insanely good. You know, if Mexico played their cards right, they could be a premier country as a gateway into the United States in terms of high-tech manufacturing. Because labor is becoming less and less. You know, moving your stuff from Asia to the United States, you're talking eight to 10 week lead times, you know? So out of Mexico, you're talking four weeks. You know, out of the United States, you're talking two weeks. So you're gonna see that you, with the supply chains, if they can't men, if they can't have these big, you have to order so much from China to be able to get your stuff. Whereas you can then go in Colorado, hey, it's going to cost me more, but I can only order what I have to when I need to, because credit's going to dry up too. So it's going to be the point being is that it, it, there's going to be a lot of change here, Dave. Don't know who the winners and losers are there. All I know is that trade is going to collapse. It's going to come in within a block. The United States is going to be the center of that block, and you're going to look at um, uh, you're going to look at the dollar strengthening before it collapses, and then you're going to look at basically the physical commodities are going to be worth more. Financial commodities are going to be worth less. Watch food. That's my mantra. Yeah, food drives the society. Always has, always will, and we're back into the grand solar minimum again. You know, take a look at the magnetic anomaly that continues to occur over southern part of the hemisphere. Look at the recovering ice at the Arctic Oscillation. Locked everything in that cool pattern this year. That's why, you know, a little further down, it was, uh, you know, a milder winter. But a quick FYI, generally when you have those locked in Arctic Oscillation patterns like we saw this year, the following winter, as in the one we're coming into, are usually incredibly brutal as that lets loose and the spill of cold air out. Think uh, Buffalo in the 1970s, for example. So ice is recovering, a lot of things are happening, and we're seeing you know, these locusts, we're seeing a lot more volcanic and tectonic uh, activity that goes along, there's signs in the skies. We have the, you know, what's that, Neowise Comet up there. And there's just an enormous amount of things happening that are fulfilling. Like you talked about Wormwood there for a second. So it's really on a lot of people's minds. So the way we perceive all this, and especially if the credit locks up, how do you think people are going to stay in their homes or be able to purchase new products or get a new car or, you know, get a larger ticket item if there's no access to credit for people and banks are really tightening on the lending there? 
So, I mean, yeah. there could be a complete lockup in that, too. And if it goes further in the economy, crowd, oh, it's the end of the world. And I can see it already. People are freaking out everywhere you look. Yeah, the Fed's going to have to step into all that stuff. And uh, and they will. You know, um, now if, Trump, if Biden gets elected, I'm not, all bets are off. So I have no idea what direction they're going to take. But, but if Trump stays in power, the, they'll just use the power of the Fed to, to unclog these liquidity issues. But, hey, I want to shift here with you because there's, an, there's a question to it. That I don't know the answer to, but I know you've, you've probably thought about it. And if I'm putting you on the spot, you can think about it and we'll talk next time. So I saw the ice flows from Antarctica, and I know we're getting a, we're already a little flow in Australia because it's been so wet and cold. If that ice, if that ice is able to squeeze up into the Tierra de Fuega and essentially block, I don't think they can, I think the current will be too strong, but, but if they get close to blocking that, when that screw the wind flows up down there in the roaring 40s, or would that cause such a squeeze in terms of uh, a wind that we get these hyper winds down in those southern oceans that can have, I don't know what the, the impact would be. Have you thought about that at all or, or researched that? Well, I have been looking at the southern oscillation and the increase in Antarctic ice as well as glacial ice on the continent itself. You know, a lot of people talk about the melting, but Please do a little research and notice out there, you're going to see where the peninsula comes out at the end where they focus a lot of melting. That's all volcanic underwater ice sheet melting and you'll see how it breaks at a perfect line. Well, you have several volcanoes melting from beneath and a lot of this, what they're trying to portend is, you know, climate change, uh, CO2, whatever, is truly underwater melting of ice sheets that are offshore that have come off the land that are still attached, but they're kind of in that float state, they're still attached, these ice sheets. If it were to block, that would take so much ice to even get up there. You'd have to, and it would probably melt off during the melt season as well. I wouldn't see it staying around for an entire uh, year. And, and if it did, we'd be into a glaciation type of thing, event there. Southern Oscillation, the winds would still be, they might get a little more ferocious, but the water temperatures would change. And see, then you're talking about the microclimates going up and down the coast of Africa and Central America. All the, I would say it would reach up to Central America, but we're looking, here's a perfect example. You know, down in South America, they had the largest snowfalls ever recorded. They had 13 meters of snow, but because they're in the COVID lockdown, nobody can go skiing. It's the largest amount of snow ever recorded. And we're going back to when the conquistadors were there and writings, because somebody who was a historian tried to find and map up and match up different uh, snows that would have paralyzed any type of society going back say four to 500 years in those areas because the Spanish kept really good records, especially climatic records because they were, they were sailing everywhere. So they were very meticulous about the amounts of snow, the amounts of precipitation, the heat, if it was an extreme heat event or extreme uh, cold on either end, they really were very meticulous about writing it down. So people going back there, historians looking for something that they would have gotten this much snow never seen even back going hundreds and hundreds of years ago. So these microclimates might match up because if there's more ice, it would affect the water temperatures up the, not only the coast of South or East and West Central America and South America, but also over into Africa up in the East and West. And then we see what happened in Australia. They had incredibly cold winter so far start and New Zealand record snows, Australia record snows early. So you can see the water patterns around uh, Australia, the continent itself, starting to change too with these microclimates with exactly what you're referencing here. The water would get cooler and we're starting to see some of these matchups now where incredible microclimates are developing because of cooler waters and again the wind would bend with that but that'd be more upper atmospheric winds that would change first to come down to these lower like say surface level winds. West um, African monsoon is a perfect example. Yeah. It changes up there the 10 millibar level way up well above where the airplanes are flying before it changes the the precipitation that is now drifting through central africa making uh deserts turn into fields so it starts in the upper atmospheric winds then it loops its way down right well if you notice too is that um we're having a, a mild la nina you know so we're not getting sharing you'd expect a lot of hurricanes this year but what's coming off what's coming off the sahara is basically blocking it and then there's a, a change in the water temperature is really fascinating because nobody's really measured the grand solar minimum before because we were just getting out into these oceans, you know, uh, and I, I just think it's going to be really fascinating to see. And uh, maybe we can talk about this more later this month, but I got to run. 
I wonder if I can do a quick plug for uh, Trade Genius before I go. You can plug as much as you want. And also, you know, GPTC. Now, Bob has a little something here. If you uh, want to get a free trading signal, just, you know, talk to him and say you saw our interview today here with David Dubine at ADAPT2030. Yeah, you got to sign up, though. Yeah, so we yes. have a if you have a signal for GPTC, um, a lot of people like to trade it when they trade, but they don't want to necessarily get a crypto account. So we, we put together a signal. Um, we've been trading Bitcoin for a long time. And then we've been watching the ratio between GPTC and Bitcoin. And so we have a signal that basically tells you if it's, if it's running at, a, at a, a discount or a premium. So you're able to get GPTC at a good price. So if you tell people you come from Dave Divine here, uh, and before Saturday, you sign up for um, our crypto um, uh, bundle or even our stock, our stock slash crypto bundle. You have access to that, but you just have to mention it. We'll give it to you for free, something we don't normally give out. And um, I think you'll like it. And then we pre-discounted bundles for you guys, Dave, like we always do. For the, um, I think it's Saturday, it's the, it's the 18th. And um, you can um, get 65% off or you can hit a, uh, American freedom and 40% off anything that's not bundled. TradeLikeAGenius.com. We're doing extremely well. Uh, people are liking what we're doing. We have a ribbon system that we think is the premier system out there. Makes it easy for you to see buy signals and sell signals. Grind your way to profit. We're not Robin Hood guys. We're not penny stock traders. We trade real stuff. And we'll help you guys make real money. And they don't go down every time there's high volume. Thanks, Robin Hood. <laughs> Use real brokers, people. Yeah, right. Anyway, hey, I got to run. All right. Well, thanks for our talk today. I've been with Bob Kudla here at TradeLikeAGenius.com. I'll leave everything in the description box below. I'll include some slides with this and uh, wish you the best through your informational searches around whoever's watching the video. Please do your own research when you're uh, talking or listening to people like ourselves talk. That way you can do your own research and we encourage you to do your own research before you just blindly listen to something. It's up to you to choose what's right for you. Great. Thanks, Dave. All right. Bye for now. Thanks, Bob. Bye-bye.